Thank you. Okay, well, um, yeah, so I was asked to talk about um, the example of breast cancer in the context of um, genetic risk prediction and, and other predictors of disease. Um, so in, the talk I'll, uh, in my talk, I'll first talk about polygenic scores, then uh, how to integrate this uh, polygenic score into um, um, risk models, and then some, uh, that with some future directions. Um, so we already heard quite a lot about breast cancer, but this is just a reminder of the context of breast cancer prevention, that we are developing these models to um, see whether we can improve our um, uh, clinical practice on how to tailor different strategies according to risk. And although, uh, as we've been also heard through, the, um, uh, through today, uh, there's a continuum of genetic risk from uh, high risk to, to lo uh, low risk um, uh, genetic susceptibility, I'll be focusing on, on, on polygenic risk scores in my talk. Um, so, uh, and we've, uh, I've worked with the Breast Cancer Association Consortium um, to uh, um, develop breast, uh, uh, polygenic risk scores for breast cancer, and this shows the numbers of um, uh, subjects that are required to uh, get precise estimates to develop these uh, scores, and then we had uh, 10 prospective cohort studies that we used for the validation of the, co of the um, uh, PRS. And this shows how uh, the PRS performs, uh, different PRSs perform in terms of the relative risk per standard deviation and the area under the curve. So we had previously published a, um, a, a PRS uh, based mainly on, a, on the a project called uh, Cox project um, that uh, where the optimal PRS included 77 um, SNPs. Um, uh, and this was the, um, the area under the curve. Now, more recently, we've doubled the size of the GWAS studies. Now, there are over uh, 120,000 breast cancer cases, similar number of controls. And then uh, we were able to, to improve the, uh, the predictiveness of the PRS. And using standard methods um, uh, with stepwise logistic regression, uh, this was uh, the optimal PRS included about 300 SNPs with an area under a curve of 63. And then we also um, uh, include, uh, try different mo models and um, machine learning, and then we could see that there you can uh, include a lot more predictors, and, and in, in, but the improvement in prediction was um, quite marginal. So in the rest of my talk, I'll, I'll focus on the uh, potential um, use of these, uh, of these 300 SNP um, and how we can integrate it into our breast cancer models. Um, so the Breast Cancer Association Consortium includes uh, mainly a woman of European um, um, ancestry, and this is the data I just showed you, the odds ratio per um, uh, standard deviation, and we can see that if we, um, when we optimize the, BR, the prediction according to the two major breast cancer subtypes uh, defined by estrogen receptor status, we could see that the, it is more predictive for ER positive than for ER negative disease, and this is probably driven by differences in sample size, um, since about 70% of breast cancers in these studies are um, from ER positive um, uh, tumors. Um, and then the other point to make is that this is, uh, work is mainly um, done in, in European uh, populations. And then when we evaluated uh, the performance of this 300 um, SNP uh, PRS in a population, in the study we have in Ghana, uh, we could see that the, uh, although it's still predictive, um, but it, the prediction is a lot lower. And, um, uh, and it's, again, it's more predictive for ER positive than ER negative. So this highlights that there is um, more work that needs to be done to uh, optimize uh, PRSs according to a different um, subtypes, particularly those that are uh, less common and more aggressive, as well as different um, ancestries. Um, so in terms of what uh, the, the, this 300 SNP PRS means in terms of stratifying uh, the population according to risk, we could see um, here the lifetime risk according to the different um, centiles of, of, the three, uh, of the 300 um, SNP PRS. And you can see that the risk certification is, is, is very substantial. Uh, women, the top 1%, 33% uh, lifetime risk compared to the average 10% or the lowest 1%, 2.5. So this is really provides a, a, a very wide um, uh, certification of risk in the population. And this can get to levels as, uh, that are comparable to um, the um, uh, high penetrance genes, uh, but the PRS is not a dichotomous variable, but it really provides us a, a, a continuous measure uh, for risk stratification. Um, the, uh, this is comparing ER positive and ER negative, so you can see that there is stratification for both diseases, but uh, because ER negative is a lot less common, uh, the, uh, the, value, the absolute risk values are, are lower, but still might be 4% of a 
risk of um, a, a aggressive disease are more likely to kill you might be um, also very relevant. Um, so now, the, what we did next, I worked with uh, Nalengian um, Chatterjee, who developed a uh, modified um, uh, LD regression score method to uh, model the underlying effect size distribution of, uh, of, um, of, of um, uh, uh, common uh, variants in GWAS analysis, in, in, in GWAS data sets, um, to try to see uh, what is, what are, how much better can we get in, in developing polygenic risk scores. And that can be expressed in many different ways. Here I'm expressing it in terms of, um, Sorry, here. Um, in terms of the um, relative risk um, at the uh, 99th percentile. So what is the relative risk of women at the top 1% compared to the average risk? So this is where we are uh, right now with the current sample sizes. So it's uh, a risk of about 2.5 fold. And here we can see as we increase sample sizes how um, this uh, is going to increase. And here shows the maximum. So there is a top of, depending on the heritability of the disease of how far we can get. So in breast cancer will be maybe around uh, uh, 4.5, but that will require more than 500,000 cases, 500,000 controls. It would, it would not even get us there. So it will require really large sample sizes. And the reason, so what they tell us is that by increasing sample size, we can improve, but this is a highly polymorphic disease. Um, and so it will require really large sizes to, to make improvements. We've compared, to put that in context, this is the, what I just showed you. We evaluated that in, three, in 13 cancer sites. And you can see that this, the, the, these curves are quite different according to different um, uh, cancers because of the underlying differences in their um, uh, genetic architecture. And just to highlight a couple, we can see uh, on the top, um, the CLL and testicular cancers where you can get a pretty high risk and you can reach them in much smaller sample sizes because they have um, um, uh, SNPs with, um, uh, on average, um, higher effect sizes. And if you compare prostate cancer to uh, breast cancer, you can also see um, that it's, um, you can get more gains. Uh, the, the, the rate of, of, of improvement will be faster than uh, disease like breast cancer. Um, another way to um, uh, evaluate these projections is to see what is the, the percent um, of the uh, uh, heritability that we can explain, of the GWAS heritability that we can explain as we increase um, sample sizes. So we are right now at around above 30 percent, and we could see here by increasing sample size, we are going to be improving um, the uh, percent heritability. So based on, on, on these um, um, uh, calculations or predictions, we um, design a, a new um, effort uh, to improve the development of polygenic risk scores for breast cancer and also to not just to, to look at polygenic risk scores but to really understand better the genetic architecture from rare to common disease uh, variants uh, for breast cancer and that we call it the Confluence um, um, uh, Project where we are planning to more than double the size of current breast cancer um, GWASs um, to explain at least 50% of the um, common heritability. And the focus um, here is to study, um, uh, to be a multi-ancestry um, uh, GWAS, to really borrow information across multiple ethnicities to improve the predictiveness of um, breast cancer across different ethnicities. We heard before that these ancestries really co continues and there are mixed populations. So by bringing them all together and not uh, uh, analyzing them in separate groups, we think we're going to be able to improve uh, the predictiveness. And also, because we uh, recognize uh, etiologic heterogeneity of breast cancer, we're going to be focusing on trying to improve uh, the predictiveness and the understanding of the genetic architecture of uh, different breast cancer subtypes. So this is an, uh, an initial uh, project that just starting, and the only way we can um, reach that goal and push the limits of breast cancer GWAS is really by working together with existing consortia and bringing new studies and new groups together. Um, so this, we, but that's why we call this more like consortium of consortia. And these are the currently participating consortia, um, uh, and then we also have um, um, collaborations with individual studies. The African Ancestry Breast Cancer Genetic Study, um, which is um, co-led by um, uh, Wei Zhang and um, uh, Julie Palmer and Chris Hyman. Um, this is an ongoing MGWAS study um, that um, it's already um, going to make uh, contributions to better understanding uh, uh, genetic susceptibility in African populations. And then once this is completed, we'll bring it together with the rest of the populations. Um, so next, I'd like to talk about, sort of, um, I'll show you the, the, the 
that the, uh, the 300 um, CPRS can really provide stratification, but how about when we put it together with other um, breast cancer, uh, known risk, uh, risk factors for breast cancer? And um, we put it all together to calculate a risk score. So we've, um, to, uh, together with an legend charter G a group at, at Hopkins, we've developed this um, eye care. This is an R package, which is, um, it's trying to facilitate, to provide a flexible tool to develop uh, risk uh, um, uh, estimators of absolute risk, not just for breast cancer or cancer for any diseases. And these are, we talked about before that came up, like sort of, can we have tools that are flexible enough for both the uh, development and the validation so that we can incorporate new knowledge as it happens and rather than having complex models that are harder to update. So this was one of the objectives of developing this, this tool and that's the tool we've used for the results I'll show you. Um, so we've heard that before also when we are looking at prediction models, we want to evaluate their calibration, discrimination and potential uh, personal and clinical utility for specific scenarios. So I won't have to go in, time to go into detail into any of those, but I'll give you some highlights of, this, um, of these aspects. So the first is about calibration. So how well are these models? How, how well do they calibrate? To do that, we compare the expected. Uh, this is um, based on 11 uh, prospective cohort studies. This is the sample size. This is focusing on women more than uh, 50 years. And these calibration plots compare the expected relative risk compared to the um, observe relative risk. So this is relative risk because the relative risk seems to be quite uh, similar across multiple studies so we could actually combine them uh, into a meta-analysis. So you can see here uh, that the for a perfect calibration all these uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, these different points are um, uh, after stratifying the population according to deciles of expected risk and comparing it with the observed so a perfect calibration will all be in, in one line. So you can see that the uh, uh, classical risk factors have a pretty good calibration, although there's a slight overestimation here and underestimation at the end. Um, but you can see that when the PRS alone has also very good calibration uh, and it provides a much wider uh, risk um, uh, stratification. And then when we put it together, these combined models have also um, a very good um, calibration, although there is a slight um, overestimation in the high end. Um, so what I show you is the, is the relative risk and uh, where we can combine uh, the uh, multiple studies. But when we are trying to evaluate the, uh, the calibration of the absolute risk, which is what we're really interested to uh, communicate to uh, women, um, these are population dependent. So, uh, and I think this shows uh, this similar calibration plot across multiple studies in the US and in Europe and, or in Australia as well. So you can see that it, it varies quite a bit uh, from one study to the other. Overall, we don't see systematic biases, but the reason why I'm showing that is because I think it's important when we show calibration of the absolute risk that it's done in multiple populations, not only on one population, which is usually what most publications do, because you could give different um, impressions if you just look, for instance, at that, that, that cohort versus that cohort. So it's important to do that in a way that is actually comparable. You can compare using methodology that's similar across studies. Um, um, so those are were epidemiological studies, um, but when you are trying to evaluate uh, risk models, it's important to do it as close as possible to where they're going to be applied in the clinical practice. And integrated healthcare systems is a good setting to do that. Um, so in, in, the, in our division, Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics at NCI, we're starting to start, stand up a new prospective cohort study uh, of 200,000 adults, uh, where we are hoping that this will provide a, a good setting for um, not just the discovery of new um, risk factors for breast cancer, maybe uh, using biomarkers and serial measurements, as well as EMR data and, and, and other uh, classical risk factors, but also a setting to evaluate the predictiveness of these uh, risk models as, as we are improving them. Um, so uh, now this is um, um, an, another way of showing how the potential value of um, adding polygenic risk scores to classical risk factors or a mammographic density. Um, so you can see this is the absolute risk distribution in the population and the different uh, curves correspond to the different models. So you can see that the, uh, the, the, the green um, uh, um, distribution corresponds to the PRS, which is wider than either of these uh, risk factors um, alone, but what you, when you really get the benefit is when you combine all the risk factors together, um, which is the, uh, the uh, yellow um, curve. And here, um, to illustrate what is the potential value, this is um, showing here the number of 
uh, women that we can identify according to models with only classical risk factors, density, PRS, and the integrated model. And these are the, the uh, number of women that will be identified that are more than 3% five-year risk, which is the threshold that's used for, to recommend um, uh, and use of uh, preventive endocrine therapies. So you can see that there is a, 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 a sharp increase in the number of women we can identify in that sector um, when we uh, uh, improve the models, and these are the number of cases that will be expected within a five year. Um, so um, here, uh, these are the numbers I just showed before. In that tail of the distribution, we'd expect um, three, uh, three, more than three million women in, the, in this population in the US, this is a, a, an example, and about 150, uh, 1,000 cases occurring in five years. If we look at percentages, that will correspond to 12% of the population that will capture about 30% of the cases. So that sh tells us that these uh, integrated models could be useful to identify these women and maybe target interventions to them. But of course, we cannot forget that most of the cases will occur outside that um, high risk uh, category. And that's why we need both always a combination of targeted as well as population-based um, um, strategies. Um, and then um, here I'd like to show um, um, and to illustrate how um, the, the fact that the, um, uh, what we have observed so far is that the uh, um, uh, genetic factors um, and the non-genetic factors and in general all the general risk factors risk cancer, they tend to multiply. Um, and that could, be, could have quite um, uh, important implications um, um, and this is illustrated in this plot where we um, uh, divided women according to the size of what we um, defined as non-modifiable risk, and this was uh, defined as PRS, family history, and then factors that we consider are usually not modifiable. Uh, they're not modified because of breast cancer risk. Um, so these are, you can see that there are, if that's the average risk, you can see a big spread of women with different levels of risk from what low to high of non-modifiable, and what this the spread here shows is the the, uh, uh, the potential uh, absolute risk reduction from changing modifiable. So this is the spread of the distribution of modifiable risk when we stratify by non-modifiable risk. So you can see that the spread here is much higher than in women that are low uh, modifiable, uh, uh, non-modifiable non risk. And this is the nature of having multiplicative effects between the multiple risk factors. So what that suggests is that if we are able to identify women that are at high risk here, they could potentially have, of course, this will have to be evaluated in, in preventive trials, but they could potentially have more impact in, in, in changing um, uh, habits than if you are at an underlying low, uh, modi non modifiable risk. Um, so, to conclude, um, I think polygenic risk scores, uh, it, it, at least in, 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 in breast cancer, they really add substantially to risk stratification. And they're very well, we measure them very well. They produce a very good model calibration. Um, and then, but integrated models uh, will be important to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to identify women that could identify, to be more precise uh, in who we identify for targeted strategies. However, um, uh, this will always have to, to if we really want to have an impact at the population level, um, we'll need to also um, intervene in, in or have population based strategies. So in terms of future directions, I, show, I, I mentioned uh, uh, the, the Confluence project where we are trying to uh, improve the PRS, and particularly and understanding the genetic architecture of breast cancers, particularly for um, subtypes and ancestry-specific uh, predictions. Um, however, uh, we saw the limits of that, uh, of genetic prediction and even of known risk factors. So to really improve that much further, we really need to identify new risk factors and biomarkers, and we are hoping that prospective studies like the CONNECT study we mentioned or the all of us are going to help us to identify uh, novel um, uh, markers uh, through new ways of uh, exposure assessment or biomarkers. And then uh, finally, um, uh, we, in addition to get better and better at, at, identify, at stratifying people according to risk, we really need better preventive and early detection um, strategies if we really want to control um, this disease. So uh, the work I show is, is the product of many collaborations, um, and here are um, um, some of my um, key collaborators in, in, in DCG um, and Hopkins and colleagues um, in, in, in the, um, particularly in the Breast Cancer Association Consortium. Thank you. Got time for a quick question or two. Got one here and then Howard. 
So I'm just wondering, is there any evidence that the PRS um, is predictive of survival time in women who have breast cancer? And is there any point in encouraging more research to actually develop independent PRS just to survival time? Yeah, so the current PRS, um, it, 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 the women at high levels of PRS tend to develop um, um, tumors with better prognosis because we're better at predicting uh, the disease of ER positive. So that's one of the, uh, I think, limitations we need to address to try to be better at, at predicting um, aggressive disease. That was excellent. Uh, when you uh, start talking about integrated health systems, I was waiting for you to say, and we're doing this within the Emerge Network to save yourself a decade of work. Um, I would encourage you to, uh, I don't know what you're planning, but uh, there's about 300,000 patients worth of, of uh, enrolled in Emerge, 120,000 which have been genotyped already uh, across uh, the United States in an integrated health system. So I'm sure you're taking a good approach, but you might want to save yourself some time. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is actually going towards the future. We're just starting that, but we definitely want to take advantage well, of existing resources. You can do resources. it now, then. You don't yes, have to have absolutely. It in the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, this is um, it has nothing to do with the uh, the NCI Connect. This is a separate, same name, but different okay, study. Yeah, different. Okay, yeah. All right, thank you very much. We need to go ahead and keep on time. Sorry. Uh, now we're going to hear from Naomi Ray about schizophrenia.